Our next guest of honor started his professional career in the US Navy doing digital communications while touring the world on a destroyer. Currently serving as the head of developer relations at DataStax, he had previously been an Oracle DBA, developer and architect for over 15 years. With our industry moving swiftly into cloud native architectures, the need for skills to get there has never been greater. DBS have the right combination of background and skills to make this transition. These skills are highly needed as developers become less involved with databases and use more of data services. To talk more about the role of DBS in leading the charge to cloud native data, let's welcome onto the East stage Mr. Patrick McFadden. Hi everyone, I'm Patrick McFadden from DataStax, and today I'm going to talk to you a bit, a little more about who you are and in this role of technology and how the world is changing around you. And I know that sounds a little ominous, but follow with me. And um, I, I have a really, you know, I have a soft place in my heart for DBAs. And to that, I'm going to say, hello, database administrators. If you're running a database or that's part of your job, this is really for you. And I really, I feel like this is an important discussion to have today because we've been, and I'm going to say we, because I'm in there too. We've been running databases for a long time from the Oracle. This is my, my old Sun 450 that used to sit under my desk. And if you, if you're old enough to know what that is, you know, that was the cool server to run Oracle on. And you know, MySQL, I think that's more popular now than Oracle ever was. Um, and then for what I've been doing for the past um, 10 years is running Cassandra databases. And they're all databases. They're not, um, there's, yes, they're all different kinds of databases, but they take a special kind of administration. And that's why DBA is a title. However, this is a time that things are changing. And that, that's why I wanted to talk to you today. And it's a very important part of our career progression that we just understand that nothing stays the same, especially in technology. If you've been in technology, you know that if you're not paying attention to the latest trends or what's happening, you know that you'll get left behind. So this is something that I've been noticing and something I want to share with you. So I've done some studies on the DBA job growth. And this is uh, some data that was pulled from LinkedIn uh, back in April, but it shows that the DBA job title growth, and this is just the job title. So you're when you get a job, you are officially the database administrator. The title, that growth on LinkedIn has been going down year over year. And I don't think it's too much of a surprise, but that's something that's very concerning to me because I know there's a lot of people that are doing this. And there has been a, a steady growth of the skill. So what that shows me is that less people are, be, are moving into the title of just being a database administrator. However, we all still have to manage databases. Databases are such a critical part of our infrastructure. And I think a lot of what we've seen now is that Kubernetes is clearly growing leaps and bounds. It's just out of control almost, where Kubernetes is taking over the infrastructure that we run. And what that has done has given a complete shift in job titling. And you'll notice several times with that rocket ship going off of Kubernetes, there's going to be some changes. And that is really down to the SRE, the Site Reliability Engineer. That title growth has gone up 14%. And no surprise, you can see that that has driven the SRE title growth, 14% year over year. And Site Reliability Engineer, that's an SRE. Those are people that run Kubernetes clusters, and that's been a growing job title around cloud-native workloads. And if you look at the skill growth, that is just absolutely blowing up. 74% year over year growth. It is the hot job field. If you're looking for placement and you're trying to find the growth field, 
I think site reliability engineering is a skill. Having that in your LinkedIn is not a bad idea because that's what employers are looking for. So let's let's back up a big notch. What does that mean for you? Is that we are going from this super specialization. So I know one part of the infrastructure and I'm moving into generalization. Now, what that can mean is that Like for instance, I used to run infrastructure a long time ago and I had uh, teams that were specialized in security and I had teams that were specialized in networking and I even had a whole firewall team, which was both. And those were very specialized roles, but they had a lot to do. And you can see as we're moving towards cloud and how infrastructure is deployed, the generalization is is a better way to be. And that means that, so whenever you, instead of having a security team, generalization means that when you do your SRE job, part of it is security. And that is a big shift. No longer do we have small groups of people that do one thing. We're having a large group of people that do everything. So let me tell you a little bit about my background. And I'm going to... I'm going to share some things with you because I think this is important that you understand that I came from this field too. So I was an Oracle DBA, still am. You know, they can't take that away. I I, I worked hard for my certifications. And I was doing this back in the, um, well, let's just say it was a long time ago. It was uh, 19 something. (laughs) But I will tell you, if you saw that I had a Sun 450 under my desk, you know that that was around 1995, 1996. So you can kind of guess from there. And I I made a pretty good career initially over running databases. And so I understand that as a specialization. It was a great time. I mean, I was doing it during the dot-com era where the database had to handle tens of users and we had to really work hard at getting that. But you know, this is something I want you to understand is that I'm not just somebody who's talking from the side. I, I'm I'm in this too. And I'm also a very well-known author. I wrote this book called You Should Use a Database. It, it's a joke. That's not really an, a, a Riley book. However, um, I think it's, this is a, the real story is I am writing right now an O'Reilly book. It's managing cloud native database or cloud native data with Kubernetes. So that is a real data, database book coming. But If I say you should use a database, I've been saying you should use a database for a long, long time. And this specialization to generalization, I mean, you think about like, like if I say you should use a database, then the specialization to generalization, what if I said, you know, what's special about this particular field? Well, specialization is we're we're the only job and our team is the, our only job is to run a database. And so now we think about generalization. What does that mean? I, I've been saying this for a little while now, and now I'm going to tell you, we need to stop using databases in a cloud native world. And yeah, I know you're probably thinking, what is this guy talking about? We always need databases. Let me explain a little bit what that means. And this is something that I think is very important to just absorb how, what this means. Stop using a database. So every application that we build, all the use cases that we build, think of one that doesn't need a database or something that needs to store data. Like all of these things, the web and mobile, microservices, IoT, they all have one thing in common. They all have a data store somewhere behind them that is persisting the data that's being collected. And that's not going to stop. That's only growing. Um, Mobile applications are growing all the time. Um, We're deploying larger and larger applications. If you expect an application to be used by a large number of people, then you need to be ready with a lot of data. And IoT is just built for storing tons of data. And if anything, it's almost too much data because when you have a device that's collecting, this is my my favorite part of IoT of explaining it to someone. IoT is giving a device an IP address so it will give up its data. That's pretty much the reason. If it's a sensor or something like that, it's going to be transmitting 
data somewhere and something's got to store it. So, and this is, <laughs> as a DBA, you know that because the database has been the middle of everything, um, the database has become the very sacred tower. This is a uh, Sauron from, uh, from Lord of the Rings. And to get that information, it's, it's like, there's this holy thing that you have to like, you have to ask, please Sauron, can we have our data? And it's kind of tyrannical where the database is the center of every universe and, and it is the most important part of your stack because of the database goes down, you're down and everybody treats the database as something a little more sacred. You just put it over in the corner. Don't look at it. Don't touch it. Uh, we never do maintenance on it. We negotiate downtime on our databases more than anything, because that is the part of the infrastructure that has to stay online all the time. And let's be fair. That's the one that's going to wake up everybody in the middle of the night. If you get a page that something is broken, the one that you pay attention to the most is the database. If the database is down, you're online. And it's just, that's just the center of the universe. And what it's created is this, um, the sacred order of DBAs, as I call them. And I, I laugh about this because I was one of them, is the database administrators are the ones that you have been the most important part of the infrastructure team because they get the center. So when developers are having a hard time with performance, who do they go talk to? Probably the DBAs. When the DBAs notice that you did something horrible to the database, when they show up at your desk, if you're a developer, if a DBA comes over and says, what are you doing? What is this SQL query that you just applied to my database? You know that you're in trouble, right? And it's because the database must remain sacred. And the DBAs are the ones who are the gatekeepers for the, that holy protection of the most important part of our infrastructure. And you know that this is also true because whenever whenever the DBAs speak up in a meeting about something that's broken, everybody listens. And we've gone through this idea, like whenever we build applications and we talk about trade-offs, and this is pretty important. This is a, you know, if, if you're, you've been in these situations where, hey, let's use a whiteboard and talk about this new thing we're going to build. When we go through that exercise, a lot of times it's just talking through the trade-offs. So we take the, the needs of the application, we talk about the scaling requirements, and then how it's going to be deployed. Those, all of those have a trade-off, meaning, well, the scaling requirements are going to be, we're going to need to take it to a certain amount of scale. And usually it's a lot. And okay, well, that means we can't use these technologies because they wouldn't scale. For instance, would you use SQLite for a database app for a data application that needed that will have potentially hundreds of millions of users? Probably not. Although SQLite is really easy to use, it's not the right choice because you're making a trade-off. So um, that's important in in those in these discussions and it usually dominates the discussion. When you're doing any kind of database or design like this, you're having to negotiate those trade-offs. And the deployment options are, will this deploy in a cloud? Will it not? And now it's, will it deploy in Kubernetes or will it not? And how easy is it to deploy? When I was running databases on a Sun, big Sun server, the deployment options, the trade-offs were, oh, if you want to have this application run on a really big server, I have to order it and I have to wait for Sun to ship me a really big server. And that sometimes took weeks or even a couple of months. So those are things that we think about like in trade-off times when we're designing our application. But cloud computing has really taken off and has eliminated a lot of the trade-offs and it's true. I mean, this is, if you're not using cloud now, you will. And I don't, I'll bet anyone listening to this talk right now is probably have some involvement in the cloud computing somewhere. And it's just, it's just the way that it, things are working. Yes, there is a lot of on-premise data centers. There's plenty of that out there. There's people still installing servers, racking them up, wiring them up. That is still happening. However, cloud is 
the, the new version of the data center that will slowly take over everything else. And it's because of Kubernetes, we really are embracing this world. And I remind you, I go back to this graph, you know, the, it, Kubernetes is growing because of our cloud growth. Cloud growth is, it's great to be able to rent what you need, but Kubernetes is making it a lot easier to implement whatever you need on top of that rental model. And what are we renting? Well, quite a bit. And I'm here to say use data services. Now this is, all right, why data services? If you recall, I said, stop using a database. Well, this is what I think we should all be building and using is data services. And I, I wanna try to convince you on this because as database administrators, we can make this world happen. This is something that we can build. And this is something that's very important for the future that we have some influence in. and will make a really great impact on how we build applications in the future. And I'm gonna walk through some of this and convince you hopefully by the end of this that, yeah, we need to stop using databases, meaning a developer that understands how a particular database technology works and gets into just using data services to build their applications. So what is a data service? Like, how do I see data services? Data services are more or less a gateway or a communication gateway, much like an, an application firewall or something like that, where my application sits above it and communicates using familiar APIs or with familiar protocols. So for instance, REST, GraphQL, gRPC, those are application protocols. They, people who build cloud native applications, they understand those really well. And there's still, you know, the protocols that the databases still, you know, still want to communicate in that we may want to still support like SQL or CQL and Cassandra land, uh, document databases, Gremlin, which is for graph. I mean, those are specific domain languages for uh, data that aren't always tied to a particular database. For instance, SQL and CQL can be used in a variety of databases, underlying technologies. Uh, same with Gremlin and Document, I guess, all four of those. But it is a very, it is a data specific protocol. But if we think about REST, GraphQL, gRPC, those are how we're building applications now. If you're using, if if you're building a front-end application using a React, then you're probably going to use like REST or GraphQL, and that's that's great. That keeps that keeps the developers working with familiar protocols, but then they communicate with the data service, which in turn is going to have like that underlying database. So like when you're using a database, and this is this is a very typical whenever you're going through an application cycle, and as as someone who administers systems. Here's how you would explain like, hey, developers, this is how you use our database. First of all, is that you have to make sure you're using a driver, a database driver. And as you know, that's one of, that was one of my least favorite jobs as a database administrator is figuring out what driver the developer team was using and if it was the correct driver, uh, especially with Oracle, you know, there was like three or four different choices and th there was some really bad ones. And um, are you using JDBC? Which version of JDBC? What level of JDBC? So we spent a lot of time making sure the drivers were correct and we had a, a repository just with the right ones. That was hard. And then your application has to initialize that connection to the database. And if you've <laughs> if you built database code, you know it's not just make a quick connection to the database. It's there's some considerations there, things like um pooling, you know, like database pooling, connection pooling, are you load balancing against a certain endpoint? There's just lots of considerations. Do you did you close your connection after you opened it? You know, open cursors, those are a thing. And so initializing a connection to a database, and a lot of times it created a stateful connection to the database, like it logged in. And that was something you have to manage. And then we create prepared statements, we execute our statements, and then we get our end result lots and lots and lots of code that go around the idea of using a database. Like that is built into our code. And I've seen some hilarious Java code that 
here's our database. This is our database application, you know, it's data-driven application. And the most of the code around it was just wrapping the database stuff. Like just here's how we initialize the connection. Here's where we do connection pooling. Here's how we manage all of the statements we're going to do. And then there's this little tiny piece of business logic that executes a statement and parses the result. And there's just tons of bugs that can happen in there, right? And then that's what we want to avoid. Well, when you're using data services, it eliminates a ton of that. And it's because there is no driver. You're using a protocol that's familiar, like REST or gRPC. And you're, you're interacting with the data service directly. And the data service's job is to manage all that. And the data service will then give back a result that's useful. Maybe it'll give it back in JSON or in the case of when you really still want to, you know, live back in the day, XML. But regardless, you know, that when you using your application, it's just a matter of getting the data and then using it. Almost no ceremony here. And this is why if you're using something like React, like a JavaScript front-end language, uh, like React or you're using Angular, those can interact with the data service without any requirements for a driver. And, you know, if you're doing everything in JavaScript, you don't want a driver anyway, right? So this is, look at what we've created here, though. We've created a whole lot of, it's a lot easier, first of all, but it's also a lot less trade-offs at this point. Now it's just fluid. You could just use it. So what a data service does is, is this is my, um, the infamous iceberg analogy, where the very tip of a data service is this thing that's just easy to use. Those details that developers don't really need to understand or dig into are all hidden in the implementation of the data gateway. And that data service that's, that exists to developers is just this very small thing on the top. And that's great. Again, less trade-offs. But those trade-offs still need to be managed underneath. That, you know, that iceberg still has an enormous piece underneath. That's that's where there's still plenty of work to be done. And foreshadowing, hello SREs, this is your world. But if we as SREs that work with data can produce something that's just that little tiny piece on the top, our developers can go faster, they'll be happier. They won't have to think about like, well, because I'm using an Oracle database, I have to do this particular query this way. No, nope, no, nope, no, nope, none of that. Or I'm going to move from MySQL to Postgres. How's that going to change things? I've seen data gateway services that can migrate databases. This is the thing that are that's coming. And, data, and developers just don't need to think about it. So what do you want in your data services? And as an SRE, these are things that will make your life easier. You need to have things that do on-demand scaling. For instance, I, I my application is taking off. I need more of it. It should be able to keep up with that. And I need it to be elastic. And this is really critical, especially with cloud workloads. You know, this is the, the name of the game with cloud is you pay per hour or per minute, whatever the unit cost is. But it's really terrible whenever you bring up a lot of cloud infrastructure and it just sits there and spends money <laughs> and you're not actually using it. Well, Elastic is, this, is the capability of your infrastructure to spin down and go the other direction. So scale is up, Elastic is down. And so when you're not using it, you're not paying for it. And that is awesome. If you look at the, the trend in serverless databases and serverless data infrastructure, that is exactly what that's for, is that I use what I, you know, I pay for the CPU when I use it, and then I don't when I don't, and then I only pay for my storage long-term. And then finally is that near 100% uptime. You should be able to get that with data services because you're building out services that are resilient, that are self-healing. And that should be something that you very easily can pull off. And I think we're getting very close to that. And that's actually the world that I live in is in near 100% uptime. I've worked with Cassandra clusters that have been online for over five years. And 
it's been a point of pride that these databases never go down. And it's because we're working with systems now that are really resilient to failure. And what does that give us? Well, it gives us that maximum flexibility going back to the whiteboard moment, like when we're building an application and you're in that meeting, when people ask, can we do these things? Yeah, we could do this and we can do that. And we can do all kinds of things. We have a lot of flexibility, but then the, when the trade-off discussion happens, it's a lot shorter discussion. And in the world of cloud native and what we're building, we want to try to use open source. And this is my, uh, as someone who works on an open source project, this is my, my appeal to using open source as much as possible. And why? Data is one of those things that is critical to a cloud company for them to keep. If you're using a cloud specific database and you know the ones that I'm talking about, if you're in Amazon, Azure, Google, they all have a data service or database that you can use there that only works in their cloud. And the reason they want to do that is this is what keeps you locked in. It's really hard to migrate data. Once you start generating a lot of data and you build a certain data model, then going from one data model to another or even one cloud to another is almost impossible because your data is in one place. Open source databases and open source in general keep you from falling into that trap of, this is what they call the walled garden. You know, when you're inside the garden, it looks beautiful. Oh, this is a really nice place. But if you want to leave, eh, not going to be able to do that. And so this is where I show like, you know, let's, let's try to think of like living without a wall on our data and open source is really the way to do that. And Kubernetes is how things are happening now across a variety of infrastructure. And as a, someone who's embracing SRE, like the site reliability engineering, this is a really key concept is I wanna be able to deploy my infrastructure anywhere from a laptop, to an on-prem server to the cloud. Um, yeah, that's an on-prem server in the middle there. I know, right? How do you represent on-prem? There it is. And Kubernetes is fueling that, that move quite a bit. And I think it's time for us to build our skills. Those skills are really important. And as you're moving from, if you're a database administrator and you're looking for the next thing, if you're looking for placement in that next really great job, I mean, if you're doing DevOps and you're specializing in databases, start thinking about doing more. And now let me talk about some of those skills. So let's go back to this, that site reliability engineering skill growth, 74% growth year over year. And it's not because there's a lot of people that want to do it. It's because there's a lot of employers that need it. I, I hear this all the time from employers. Who, where are the site reliability people? The people that know how to run infrastructure? And let's talk about that. So SRE, this is a, a great, I love this definition of SREs. You can, you can read through this, but I'm going to break it down a little bit. And, you know, this, this is a good thing to try to understand, like, what is an SRE? So we have, I broke out these five, or sorry, yeah, five different pieces of this. There is availability, latency, change management, emergency response and capacity management. I pulled those out of this big thing right here. Now, why did I pull those out? Because those look super familiar for anyone who runs databases. Like, yeah, these words all make sense to me. I have availability, latency that I worry about. There's change management. There's emergency response. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably the worst one in my job <laughs> is emergency response because it never happens in the middle of the day. Oh no, it happens in the middle of the night, right? <laughs> and capacity management. One of the things that's the really, really hard is do I need enough of this? Um, how am I going to be when I don't have enough of it? So looking at our skills that we're building, the web and mobile microservices, IoT, you know, we know that they all go to databases. And those, the, these are not going to change. For SREs building applications and cloud native applications, we're still going to have these data. That data is still going to be in the middle of this. And when we build applications, we've gone through this, this world of change that is very similar. 
And the way, the reason I'm saying that is because yes, the methodologies are changing, but the outcomes are pretty much the same. You know, we're building infrastructure for applications. We went from the world of a single server to virtual machines. So, uh, you know, if you've ever, you know, if you ran an on-prem, you know that you were racking up like a, a HP or Dell or Supermicro, something, some server that went into a rack. And then we stopped doing that as much and we started going to virtual machines. Um, there's a variety of technology that is virtual machines. And they all have the same thing going there. But now we're building out a new thing, which is what? It's virtual data centers. And that's, that's kind of interesting. You know, we, we went from one server, multiple fleet of servers running as virtual machines. Now we're building out entire virtual data centers. And they all, they're all trying to utilize three things as best as possible. And that is compute, network, and storage. Compute, network, and storage are the three resources we have to manage. And if you don't have enough of each one of these, then you're in trouble. And when we did it on a single server, we were using com configuration and kernel tweaks. When we we're in virtual machines, we were using parameters around the virtual machine. Now with virtual data centers, this is where Kubernetes is making it so that we now think of things in the macro sense, like how do individual processes work together? And these new skills that we're building are around that. So, this is the new skills, some of the, the new skills that we're, I'm going to pull out of this. If you've been as a, in DevOps and especially as a DBA, you probably have had some coding experience. This is not something that you're not, you're, it's not weird whenever you start writing a little bit of code because that's just a part of the job. But thinking about it, the next step, if you write the code, SREs are there also for like, how is that code deployed? And so it's not just the what you're deploying, it's how it's being deployed. And how code deployed, configured, and monitored, that's a really big task. So let's dig into that a little bit. CI CD pipelines are the fuel for applications now in cloud native. This is what really drives speed and efficiency. So when we developers write code and they commit it into a repository. Then it does the build, it does a unit test, and then an integration test in this continuous integration portion. And you're probably familiar with this. This is not a new thing at all, but it's really important to be very good at this. And this is something, this is an SRE skill that will get you hired immediately because this is hard. But building this once and making sure it runs well is a really big part of like building applications at scale. Because, and this is, I work, like I said, on the Cassandra project. This is something we've been struggling with for a very long time. Is how do we get continuous integration so that when we're constantly adding changes to the database software itself, that we can get through all of this and have it put out um, reliable code after it's been tested. There's just a lot of moving parts. But this is a really great, a great thing to get involved with, especially with the deployment part. I think the continuous integration is probably a bit easier because it's just, you know, doing a build and an integration test. The continuous deployment is the part where cloud native is really, uh, that is where it's needed the most. I want to be able to stage it and then finally put it into production. And if you look at companies that do this really well and the teams that do this really well, this can happen multiple times a day and it just works. And that's something to drive towards. The next is observability. And again, as a database administrator, this is not unfamiliar. You know, we've done this uh, for a long time where we have all of the all of the metrics and things like that. But observability is taking that, like, let's go look at a few metrics to a completely different place. And what that what it embodies is looking at the entire application stack and from the human requesting something all the way down to the data layer and then back again. And the observability gives us this view of the entire application to see how things are working. When you're building complex infrastructure and when, when you're, you know, when you're a DBA, you're building a complex 
service, one thing, and it's that one database. And of course, you know, you, you know how to use a V dollar sign tables in Oracle, or you know which metrics to watch in MySQL. And that that's a really critical part, because if you start seeing things going the wrong direction, like, oh, too many cursors are open, you know that that database is going to shut down before you know it, then that is going to be, you know, that method and that, that reasoning now expand that as an SRE to your entire stack. You have these skills already, probably better than a lot of other roles in you know, the DevOps community. If you're a DBA, you know what metrics mean and how important they are. Well, let's expand this out. Like for instance, one of the key things about observability is watching the flow of that application. So as it hits the, the front end logic, even in like a React code, and it goes through microservices and finally to the data layer. Are there delays in there? How's it look whenever we go from beginning to end? And then the other one is knowing the code. It is, it is not optional anymore to just sit on the sidelines and set let someone else develop code and, and not know what's going into your infrastructure. That was one of my favorite things back I, a long time ago. I used to go to Velocity, which was a great DevOps conference. And you know, I remember seeing one of the presenters say that the job for operations is to block developers from putting their terrible code into your production. <laughs> and well, yeah, we don't want your terrible code. <laughs> but now with SREs, it's time to be a little bit more of a team player. Sorry. The team, the team is that you need to know that code that's going into the infrastructure so you can understand what is happening, why it's working. And knowing the code is not optional anymore. A good example is how are things interacting with multiple services inside of your Kubernetes stack? And knowing how that works gives you a better ability to deploy the right, the right services and just knowing all of the pieces and parts. That way, whenever you look at your observability, let's go back to this. When, when you think about observability as a, a feature of your stack, knowing the code means that you understand like when you see something going the wrong direction, you know where that is and how it needs to be addressed. It doesn't mean you have to fix it, but you can go back to the developer teams and say, look, I noticed that you have a loop on this particular gRPC call when you don't really need to do that. That's a pretty cool skill to have. So finally, where are we going next here? And I, I making this phone, this call to DBAs, because like I said, I think this is an important moment for database administrators everywhere, in, especially in, you know, DevOps in general is, is just it is such a critical field for cloud native, but I think DBAs are going to lead this charge to, to being the best SREs in the world. And where do we go next? Well, I think if you're interested in this, I mean, get involved in the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. I This is where I spend a lot of my time. I am on the TOC, the Technical Oversight Committee there. Just understand what's happening there. This is where Cloud Native and SREs are building and doing cool things. Get involved in some projects. See what's going on out there. And for you, you know, knowing and understanding like all the pieces, that's going to make it easier for you in the long run, talking about building out infrastructure and being an SRE. And then the other thing is YouTube. YouTube is your friend. There is so much stuff out there about being, uh, especially around DevOps, Tech World with Nana is a really good one. Um, but YouTube has a lot of great resources and um, you can get some great training on just some basics how to deploy things in Kubernetes, um, how to deploy data services, that sort of thing. At Datastax, we run workshops all the time for SREs. And it's just meant to, how do you deploy data infrastructure? We have uh, projects, uh, I work on a couple of projects, Kate Sandra, for instance, which is uh, running Cassandra and Kubernetes. And we have workshops on that on YouTube, all free certifications. And then there's another project I work on called Stargate, which creates a data gateway. And again, workshops are all free on YouTube. So YouTube is a great resource for you to get started. And it doesn't require a lot more than just your time. And then finally, another community that I think is really important for where we're headed as data SREs and moving, making this move from DBA to, to SRE is the data on Kubernetes community. Um, you can Google that. 
data and Kubernetes community is, is right. Mostly a meetup community. It's also, but there's a lot of information that's coming together around trying to help people run data on Kubernetes. And it's not just here's an, another DBA uh, SIG. It is very holistic. It's things like storage, networking, actual data products. So this is a community that it would be great for you to get involved in. And we would love to have you there. So finally, thank you very much. I appreciate the time that you've given me all 45 minutes, but I just want to leave you with one thing is that if you're a DBA, this is the time to make that move to SRE, embrace data services. This is the future. And if any point you want to talk about it, I'm always available. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter. Let me know if you want to talk more about it. I'd be happy to do it because I am a DBA. I've been making this transition to SRE myself. I get it. I understand you. And thank you very much for your time.